Would you uh, raise your right hand and repeat after me? I am McLaughlin. I am McLaughlin. To solemnly swear. To solemnly swear. That I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. That I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. Against all enemies. Against all enemies. Foreign and domestic. Foreign and domestic. That I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. That I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. That I take this obligation freely. That I take this obligation freely. Without any mental reservation. Without any mental reservation. Or purpose of evasion. Or purpose of evasion. And that I will well and faithfully. And that I will well and faithfully. Discharge the duties of the office. Discharge the duties of the office. Of which I am about to enter. Of which I am about to enter. So help you God. So help me God. Madam Secretary. Thank you all and welcome. And special greetings, of course, to John and the other members of Anne's family. And by the way, John, today you are not allowed to interrupt anyone by saying, all right, let's close this issue out. <laughs> I will remain silent. <laughs> all the same, I will keep my remarks this day brief. I often think that when Grant arrived in Washington in 1864 to be nominated general in chief, the longest speech he managed was, gentlemen, in response, it'll be impossible to do more than thank you. Then there's the comparison, of course, between George Washington and William Henry Harrison. Washington gave an inaugural address of fewer than 200 words and went on to become a, a great president. Harrison spoke for almost two hours at his inauguration, caught pneumonia, and was dead within a month. <laughs> I, I told him that day to keep it short. <laughs> the, the reason for brevity today is that this is virtually a family event. And Anne McLaughlin has served our administration in the Treasury Department and the Department of the Interior. She's proven her skill and dedication. She's placed her stamp on our so-called revolution. And today she's stepping up to a position in which she'll be able to do still more. The purpose of the Department of Labor is, in the words of the act that created it, to foster, promote, and develop the welfare of the wage earners of the United States. Anne will bring to the department her own special competence. To quote her before the Senate, I will be fair but firm. Well, then, too, she will bring to the department her passionate sense of commitment. As I said, she'll work to further the economic beliefs that have gone into the making of our revolution especially the belief that the best we can do for America's workers is not give them endless government programs, but provide them with new jobs in a growing economy. Indeed, for some 60 months now, the American economy has averaged well over 200,000 new jobs a month. And you must ensure that the workforce of the future is ready and willing to keep America the most productive and innovative nation on earth. At the same time that She'll be planning for the future and will be on Capitol Hill dealing with Congress on major issues such as parental leave and mandatory health benefits. And underlying all Anne's energy and skill, all her immense administrative ability will be an abiding faith in the dignity of work. In her words, hardworking women and men built America. To be able to assist them is a singular responsibility because it is in our daily work that we find some of our greatest opportunities for good. Her words to the Senate. Anne McLaughlin, congratulations. Thank you, Mr. President, for those gracious comments. And to be quoted by you is quite a tribute. Thank you. Your trust is very special to me. 
as I rejoin your team, I might add. I want also to thank Judge Riley for administering the oath. Judge Riley is a longtime, very special friend to John and to me. But more importantly, I think he will be serving as a mentor. Judge Riley served as solicitor at the Department of Labor under Mrs. Frances Perkins, the Secretary of Labor, the other woman Secretary of Labor. <laughs> You know, Mr. President, in the months that I spent away from official Washington, I never really felt apart from this team at all. This is a testimony to what your leadership means to me and what I think it means to every American. We are all renewed by your vitality, by your ideals, and your focus on America's future. Evidence of that during this last historic week was certainly ample. Now, no one knows better than you, Mr. President, the importance of family and friends. And today, I am so pleased and tremendously honored that so many are able to join us here from as far away as London, England, and as close as 1700 Pennsylvania Avenue. I'm proud of my government service. I am proud that we as an administration have made a difference in the life of every American. Today, the American workers' take-home pay is no longer ravaged by that double-digit inflation or by spiraling taxes. Today, over 14.5 million more jobs exist in this, the longest peacetime recovery in history. Today, we are confident of ourselves and of our nation. But also today, I think of what remains to be done. American workers deserve safe and protected workplaces. They need affordable child care. They deserve secure pensions, fair and equitable wages, benefits, education, training opportunities. You know, workers are people we know. Our parents, our sons, our daughters, our friends, our colleagues, and our neighbors. The future of the American workforce and the American workplace will look nothing like it does today and will be bring tremendous challenges. My responsibility to you and to the millions of American workers is to prepare them and us for that tomorrow. I believe the Labor Department's role is to ensure the transition to a continuing competitive and productive future. We must provide for an economy where labor and management will work together to meet the competition from abroad. The day must never come when skilled workers have to be imported. We must never have a worker deficit in this country because we failed as a nation to provide opportunities for excellence in education and training. These past six years, we have put millions of Americans back to work. Now our goal is to keep America working. Now on a personal note, people have told me to expect some scrutiny because I am a woman. The first in 50 years named to this job and the second to hold it. If that proves to be the case, so be it. But I will do my part to make that attitude a thing of the past. Simply by doing my job responsibly, I shall perhaps help everyone understand that women running the government's business is business as usual. <laughs> it's no secret I went to an all-women's college, and I think many of them are here with that applause. <laughs> I am deeply honored, Mr. President, by the office you have entrusted to me. With your support and the support of friends and family in this room, and with my dedicated staff at Labor and the wonderful Labor Department workers, there is nothing we cannot achieve in this next year. I feel awed by the responsibility, but tremendously eager and enthusiastic to take on the challenges. Thank you so much. there, but on the very subject of education and the place of women in the workplace, I think that you'll, you'll be happier and if you know that I didn't happen, I didn't go to an all-male school. <laughs> <laughs> and I had to work my way through school, but with regard to people in the workplaces, I had one of my better jobs in my entire life. Looking for I washed dishes in the girls' dormitory. <laughs> <laughs> 